I'm so excited to get into the word of God with you. Um, if, if you're watching from home, I want you to post a picture of how you're watching. If you're sitting on a couch, send us a picture, take a selfie on the couch. If you're eating a Pop-Tart, hold that Pop-Tart up. I want to see it. Praise the Lord. I want to see how we're having church today. But sit back, get comfortable, and get ready to hear the word of God. The Bible says that uh, the institution of mankind on planet Earth was instituted for mankind to have dominion. Somebody say dominion. See, when you begin to understand dominion, then you begin to understand how this whole thing really plays out. The Bible says that Jesus preached this message almost exclusively. John the Baptist preached this message almost exclusively. They said this, repent or turn because the kingdom of God is at hand. If you can get an understanding of kingdom, you can understand the rest of the Bible. If you do not understand kingdom, you will spend the rest of your life trying to explain the inexplicable. If you do not understand kingdom, if you do not understand that believers are to be kingdom ambassadors, you will spend the rest of your life trying to explain things that you don't have any business trying to explain. You will feel the burden of trying to explain every problem that comes on planet Earth. You will feel the burden of trying to explain every sickness, every tragedy, every uh, natural disaster. You will feel that burden or that weight if you don't understand kingdom. Because when you understand kingdom, you begin to understand you were not just called to be here uh, in effort to just survive until we get to heaven. No, you are called to be a literal ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are called to be a literal ambassador of a brand new kingdom that is here right now. Come on, if you're sitting next to somebody on the couch, just bump them one time and say, right now. You are called to be a literal ambassador of the kingdom of Almighty God. As a matter of fact, to really get an understanding of this, we can go to Genesis 1, 2, 3. Now, most of us are in some type of a shelter-in-place order all over America. Uh, many of us uh, are, are, are told to stay home unless we have to leave for essential purposes. So what that means is this. You have a unique opportunity even in the middle of these challenges. And the unique opportunity is the amount of time you have now allows you to do what you said you would do if you just had more time. What is that thing that you said you would do if you had more time? Is it to write a book? Is it to maybe read the Bible more? Is it to read the, the New Testament? Is it to read the, the Old Testament? L let me offer you some advice if you haven't thought about it. Why don't you read Genesis 1, 2, and 3 through the lens and the understanding that this entire thing is all about a kingdom. Somebody say kingdom. See, it's all about a kingdom. And when you begin to get a revelation on kingdom, then you can understand the rest of the book. But I'll give it to you some cliff notes here, okay? In Genesis 1, God called everything into existence. There's nothing more powerful that you have than the words that come out of your mouth. God spoke and said, let there be light, and there was light. Then the Bible says, on the sixth day, God created man, or he developed how he was going to create man. He gave mankind dominion, and in, in uh, chapter number two, the Bible says he formed man out of the dust of the earth. Now, this is very important. 
because as the dust of the earth was formed, now all of a sudden God breathed his breath or his spirit into mankind. He had already spoken that man would have dominion. And now because of the spirit of God, now mankind literally has authority. So God's plan was to call things into existence until he had a representative on planet earth, mankind, until he had a representative on planet earth to take dominion and authority. So when God gave man dominion on planet earth, the Bible says he gives his gifts without repentance. God doesn't give you a gift and then take it away. That's why many people are incredibly um, uh, charismatic or a, an incredible talent that has a great gifting and they don't use it for God. God doesn't snatch that gift away from them. That's because he gives his gifts without repentance. He did not want a bunch of robots that couldn't turn away from him. That's not love at all. He wanted people that willingly give their life for him. So in Genesis 1, he called everything into existence. He created man. Uh, Think about if you were building a house, the first thing you would do is you would make some blueprints. Here's where I'm gonna put the porch. Here's where I'm gonna put the roof. Here's how big the bathroom's gonna be. Her closet's gonna be three times bigger than my closet. Come on, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And then before you actually can live in the house, you have to go from the creation stage to to the form stage. Now you begin to form that house up. You pour your foundation. You put your walls up. You put the roof on. And you take the idea that you created and you form it. Once it is formed, now you can actually live in it and use it. So mankind was created in Genesis 1. Are you still with me? Just hit me an amen there in the comment if you're still with me. He, he was created. Mankind was created in Genesis 1. But then mankind was formed in Genesis 2. Once mankind was formed, now all of a sudden God put his breath on the inside of mankind. And I want to point out something real interesting. In Genesis 1, God called things into existence. In Genesis 2, mankind began to call things into existence. As a matter of fact, God said he brought the animals by Adam to see what he would call them because he had given over dominion and authority to mankind. Then in Genesis chapter number three, mankind lost his position of authority because the Holy Spirit could no longer dwell inside of mankind because mankind, uh, when mankind sinned, mankind was stained with sin. So the Holy Spirit could no longer dwell in an impure vessel. We would need to be cleansed to be able to be a candidate to house or to be a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Therefore, in Genesis 1, this is a recap, God called everything into existence, created man, designed man, Genesis 2, then he formed man, breathed the breath of life into him. Now mankind has the authority that was set in uh, in him by the Spirit of God. And then in Genesis 3, God, uh, uh, mankind loses the authority. In other words, still has the voice, just doesn't have the authority that he had in Genesis 2. Now, I say this because when you understand kingdom, you understand this is a cataclysmic or humongous uh, uh, war going on between the two kingdoms. So what God needs on planet earth is he needs representatives or ambassadors that will speak the word of God into this environment called earth or the world that we are in now. Before God created man, God had dominion on planet earth. God then gives that dominion to man. Uh, You can read about it in Genesis 1. You can read about it in Genesis 2. But if you look, God stops calling things and starts calling people. God stopped calling things into existence and started calling people to speak into the environment. That's why, listen to this, 
That's why Jesus almost always called himself the son of man. He is the son of God. He is the son of man. Son of God means he has all authority. The entire, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He numbers the stars and knows them by name. The son of God means he has all power and all authority. But listen to this. This will set you free. Knowing he is the son of man means he has dominion right here. That's why he had to be born through a woman. That's why he had to be born through the door or the gate that every other person after Adam and Eve comes through to get on planet earth. Matter of fact, the Bible says anybody that doesn't come through the door is a thief. That's why the devil despises you so much because he didn't come through the door. He has no dominion here. He has no legal dominion here. He tries constantly to convince people to do his uh, uh, deeds and to be motivated by him. And even in some cases be possessed by an evil spirit because a, a, a earth suit, remember Adam was formed out of the dirt or out of the earth. An earth suit, a dirt suit, if you will, is required to have dominion on planet earth. That's why the devil is constantly trying to convince people to do things because he has no dominion. He needs somebody who has dominion to do something or say something. That's why what comes out of your mouth is so important. Because what you say, you will see. You were made in God's likeness and God's image. And God calls things into existence. When you speak, you are calling things into existence. Let's quickly go to the word of God. Open your Bible to Ezekiel chapter number 37. Very exciting chapter in the Bible. It, it's the chapter of the valley of the dry bones. It's really exciting to read, but we're going to start in verse one, going to read four verses. The hand of the Lord, Ezekiel 37, verse number one, the hand of the Lord was upon me. Come on. I just dare you to just say that right over yourself. The hand of the Lord is upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. In other words, they were dead. They had been there for a while. There was no life in them. Verse three, and he said unto me, listen, son of man, can these bones live? This is God speaking to the prophet Ezekiel. And he doesn't call him Ezekiel because he's trying to tell you and me something thousands of years later. He said, son of man. In other words, one who has dominion here. Can these bones live? God is saying to us even now, those of us who are blood-bought, who are washed in the blood of the Lamb, who are believers on the Lord Jesus Christ, who know him crucified, resurrected, ascended, and coming back for us, he is speaking to us even now in this season and saying, can you speak to the dry areas of your life, son of man, daughter of man? You have dominion. You have authority to call things that are not as though they were. He said, he said Ezekiel, can you speak for for me because I have handed the keys, I've handed the authority to mankind and I need you to say in the atmosphere that you reside in what the word of God says. He says to him, he says this, he says, son of man, can these bones live? And, and, and Ezekiel did what you and me would do. He said, Lord, you know this. You know the answers. I see through a glass darkly. I, I see uh, uh, just, just in part, but Lord, you know the end from the beginning. You know how this whole thing's going to play out. So in other words, you don't look at the problem to try to find your answer. You look to the word of God to try to find your answer. 
You don't look at the problem to find your answer. You don't look at the problem. You find, now look, I'm going to act like this is my Bible, but this is my notebook. I read my Bible off of my iPad 90% of the time. But you go to the word of God to find the answer for the problem. Stop dissecting every problem that you go through to the point that you just have a headache at the end of the day. You don't, you don't solve a problem by staring at the problem. You solve a problem by staring at the word of God until you find the answer to the problem you have on hand. The Bible says, Ezekiel looks at him and says this. He says, he says, God, you know. In other words, I got to know what you say before, my God, I feel you in this place. I got to know what you say, God, before I determine what I say. Write that down if you can. If you're taking notes, you got to find out what God says before you find out what you're going to say. I'm not going to be loose with my mouth when he said to me, listen, the power of life and death is in your mouth. So you got to find out what does God's word say about this area of my life? What does God's word say? It's on everything and on everybody's mind right now. The nation has not been here in a hundred years or so. We've never experienced anything like this. Everybody's talking about the coronavirus, COVID-19. I'm wondering if they called it COVID-19 because everybody's going to gain 19 pounds while we're eating everything in our pantry. Coronavirus, crown virus. The devil is trying to crown the world with sickness and doubt and fear and poverty, trying to shut down the economy, trying to crown humanity with a curse. But Jesus already bore the crown of the curse for you and me. So our condition is not to examine the problem so much. Listen, here's here's what happens. If you focus so strong on the problem, you will start defining God's word by the problem instead of defining your life by God's word. You'll start trying to, well, this is why that happened and this is why that happened. And just staring at the problem, staring at the challenge, staring at the issues until you finally get to the place where you start, you start hiding behind this is why that happened and this is why that happened. No, let me tell you something. God doesn't make his children sick, period. Somebody ought to put that in the comments. God does not make his children sick. You want to know how I know? He's a good father. And if you knowingly put a sickness on one of your children, we would throw you in prison and I would be the first one to do it. That's called child abuse. That is literally, and and I don't know, I'm using the S word a lot lately. That's what the kids call it around my house. It is the stupidest thing I've ever heard that God is somehow making his offspring sick when he actually sent his son to heal us of all diseases, infirmities, or any plague of the devil. God does not make his children sick. So God says to Ezekiel, he says, he says, son of man, the one who can call this something and see something happen. The one who has dominion, the one who has uh, that place of dominion that I've set you in. Son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel effectively said to him, let me find out what you say. And then I will tell you what I'm going to say. He said, thou knowest, oh God, you know, God, you're the one that knows. Did you know God knows the end from the beginning? He knows every part of your life before it even plays out. You got to find your answer in God's word. And sometimes you got to find that place that you're going to stand on in God's word. What am I going to stand on? I can't just come up with a good idea. Listen, a good idea might work. A God idea will work. A good idea might come to pass. But if God says it, listen to this, that settles it with me. 
He said, he said, can these bones live, son of man? He said, thou knowest, verse four, again, he said unto me. In other words, the next thing he said to me was prophesy un- upon these bones and say unto them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Let me say it differently. God says to Ezekiel, he says, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says to him, thou knowest, Lord. In other words, before I just go spouting off, I got to find out what you say. Before I just go saying what I think all the time, I got to know what you say. Did you know saying what you think all the time will keep you in bondage the rest of your life? Because what you, what, what you think changes with the wind. It changes with your age. It changes with your tax bracket. It changes with your experience. It changes with where you live. It changes with how long you've been there. It changes with what other parts of the world you've seen. What you think changes like the breeze. But God's word never, ever changes. That's why it is not valuable for Christians. Now, I'm talking to Christians. If you're not a Christian, I want you to tune me out for about three seconds, okay? And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to become a Christian in just a minute. But for Christians, it is not profitable to spend extreme amounts of time just uh, rolling around, and I would say it like this, meditating on what you think. No, no. It is valuable to meditate on God's word day and night and roll it around. And and I was shocked when I became a pastor about a few things. I don't know if I've ever shared this. Maybe I have. But I was shocked about a few things. When I became a pastor, I spent the bulk of my life serving pastors, serving ministers. And the ones that, that, that I was under, are they're phenomenal. I have great relationships with them even today. But some of the ones that I had known, some of the ministers that I knew that I you know, helped from time to time or whatever, not the pastors that I come from, but some of the ministers, I just thought like ministers talked about the word of God a lot. I thought that was like the, the top of the docket on, on conversation. So uh, when, when I became a pastor and I met some of these uh, people again, if you will, like, like, in other words, now I was considered a peer to them and not just somebody who was helping them. I found out quickly, like, like talking about the word of God was not the standard with everybody. A matter of fact, a lot of times I would excuse myself from communication with people because I was very uncomfortable with what would come out of their mouth. I was very uncomfortable with what they would just brush aside and, 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 and decide that, oh, I'm not going to worry about that or I'm not going to care about that. And I thought, I thought, what in the world is going on? No, what happens is this. When you make the word of God your position, your position is backed up by the word of God. But if you make your position just your thought, if, if, if it's just, this is what I think today, this is, what I, this is what I've decided today. Just think about it for just a second. Anybody that's over you know, 20 years old, think about what you thought when you were 15 or 16 years old. Think about how much you have changed since then. No, Ezekiel said, the, Ezekiel was asked, can these bones live? And he said, you're gonna have to tell me. I got to find out what your Bible says effectively because now the word of God to us is the Bible. I got to find out what you say, God, before I determine what my position is. So for the last week or two, I've been talking about being tested positive. You know, the Lord told me in 2019, this would be a year of testing will be a year of extreme or graduated testing. And we're seeing it everywhere. Nothing is on the news more than the concept of being tested right now. So the question is, when you are tested, can you remain positive that God's going to do what he said he would do? The story goes on with Ezekiel and God says to him, I want you to prophesy or out of your mouth, I want you to tell these bones to listen to the word of the Lord And he later goes on, tell them to live. And the Bible says that they came back together and joints and marrow came and sinew came and skin. And these these bones came back to life, but they didn't come back to life until 
Ezekiel said it. Because the son of man or mankind is what has dominion here. That's why God's word doesn't do anything for somebody who doesn't speak it and believe it. I'm going to say that again because it's pretty heavy. I mean this respectfully, but God's word does nothing for you if you do not believe it. You've stayed in hotel rooms that have Bibles in the dresser and it did nothing for you. The Bible on your, on your book stand, on your nightstand or your coffee table does nothing for you. The part of the word that works for you is the part of the word you believe and the part of the word that you speak. You remember he said, if you'll believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. That's how you are born again. And it's how you actually receive anything in the Bible. You believe it and then you speak it. And the time to speak it is when the bones are dry. The time to speak it is when you don't see it. Because in Genesis 1, God called everything into existence, but then he called mankind to speak what he said. Because what you say, you will see. What you say, you will see. If you will commit to the word of God, that means your position is like Ezekiel. You know the answer, God. Now, for the virus, for the challenging time that we're in, for uh, the struggles with your children, the struggles in your marriage, for anything that comes across your table, anything that comes across your plate, it's not just what you think, because what you think might work, but God's word never fails. So instead of just being so burdened by having to have the answer for every little thing, you can go to the word and say, you know, oh Lord. Come on, when, when, when somebody has been uh, sick in your family, when somebody has been going through a disease in your family, when somebody's been going through a challenge, that's the time to declare healing. That's the time to say what God said and then tell all the other thoughts to be quiet in your head because the devil is a liar and he's gonna try to get you into doubt and unbelief. Right now, our country, the world is in a season of dry bones. It looks like the answer is nowhere to be found. So the question is this, can these bones live? And the answer is, you know God. So for us, we got to take his knowledge and get it out of the book and into the atmosphere. We got to take his knowledge and get it out of the pages of our Bible and into the atmosphere. We got to make a big shift even now. Don't turn there. I'll do it for you. Hebrews chapter number four, verse number 12 says this. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Why soul and spirit? Because your soul is saved by the blood of Jesus, but your soul consists of your mind, your will, and your emotions, and they will constantly war against your spirit. That's why you need the word of God to come in there and put that division between what you're thinking and how your emotions are feeling and how your spirit is because your spirit is in complete rest with God. Your spirit has been born again. Your spirit has been blood bought. You are in total unison with God on your spirit side, but your soul can be pulled to your flesh so easily. You need the word of God to divide and make sure that our emotions are not running rampant over our life. 
He said, the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Let me say it differently. When you read the word of God, the word of God reads you. That's why it doesn't matter if you've read Matthew chapter three before. When you read it again, it feels like it's applying to the life or the segment of life you're in right now. Because the word of God discerns you. It deciphers you. It, the word of God makes, makes clear your intentions. Sometimes we're doing the right things, but our heart's not in the right place. Because we're spending so much time thinking about, well, here's what I'd do if I could do what I want to do. Well, I'll tell you what, you need to crucify that thought. And you just need to do it because Jesus does it. You need to do it because he changed us, because he loves us. Because our purpose is to love people and point them to Christ. That word, he said, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That word in the original language is the word die, which means two or twice, stomos, which is like mouth or talk. The word of God is sharper than a twice spoken word. Why didn't God just talk to Pharaoh? Why did God send Moses to say to Pharaoh what he wanted Pharaoh to hear. Because sons and daughters of man have dominion here. He needed a man of the mud or a man of the earth. One translation says man of the mud. It's what Adam can be translated to. He needed a son of man to go say what God wanted said. The first time it was spoken was when God spoke to Moses. The second time or the diastomos is when Moses said it to Pharaoh and then all of a sudden creation responded. Ezekiel is there and he said, can these bones live? He said, only you know. And he said, son of man, the one who has dominion, Tell these bones to live. Why didn't God just speak to the bones? Because he doesn't take dominion back just because man is crazy. Just because humanity is nuts. He doesn't snatch dominion away because he gives his gifts without repentance or without turning away from them, without taking them away from them. So the same thing in your life, the word of God is sharp, sharper than a two edge, a twice spoken word. So our job, if you say, how do I test positive? How do I go through this and come out of it positive? I'll tell you how it's the twice spoken word. It's finding out what does God say. Psalm 91 says, no plagues coming near you. Psalm 91 says, a thousand will fall at one side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it won't come near your house. Psalm 91 is the word of God. And when it comes out of your mouth, it's activated in the atmosphere that you reside in. That's how you test positive. You don't let your mind just run rampant and to, to tell you all these thoughts and all these doubts. No, this is a lot more than a virus. Look at what it's trying to crown the whole earth with. It's trying to crown us with the curse when Jesus already bore that crown. Somebody just put in the comments, not my crown. Because when you say what God says, God's word backs you up. So with everything that I have in me, I join my faith with yours. And I say, let's test positive. When we get to the other side of this, let's just brag in the devil's face on our God and say, I told you he was gonna do it. 
I told you he was going to make a way. I told you he was going to make a way where there was no way. I told you he was going to show up. I knew it and I never strayed from it. And the moment that you feel yourself just leaning a little bit, you take the two-edged sword and you let it divide soul and spirit. My emotions may be running crazy, but my spirit is at peace. My emotions may be going insane, but my spirit is at peace. Oh, they're going to be laying people off. He supplies my needs according to his riches and glory in Jesus' name. You begin to let that be your standard. You let the word of God come out of your mouth. And when it is spoken out of your mouth, it's the second time it's been spoken. And now, literally, it divides you. The plagues hit all of Egypt. But the Israelites didn't have the same experience. You hear what I'm saying? There's a time when being a Christian means standing on the word of God, even in the valley. Father, I pray that your people have heard your voice today and not mine. I pray that we test positive. I pray that your anointing overflows every member of this church. Now, if you're watching today and you're not born again, I, I wanna give you the opportunity to say yes to Jesus before we leave. If you say, I've never given my life to him or you've backslid, I want you to pray this prayer from the bottom of your heart. Say this, say, oh God, I come to you now and I ask you to save me. Write my name in your book. I believe Jesus died and rose from the dead for my victory. I'm a Christian now, on my way to heaven, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Listen, I'm so proud of you if you made that decision. Shoot us a comment, send us a direct message. Give us a call on that number. We'd love to pray for you and celebrate that decision with you. Thank you so much to our First Touch team, our prayer warriors. Let's stay in faith, stay encouraged, stay connected with your life group and all your First Touch team members. Be the hands and feet of Christ. If you can help, help. Praise the Lord. Nobody has to have specific, uh, nobody has to have a badge to be a Christian. No, we're just going to be Christian. And even in this challenge, we are going to test positive. Come on, just say that. Say, I'm going to test positive. I'm going to see God move in my life in Jesus' name. Well, I love you. Pastor Crystal loves you. I so miss seeing your faces. In Jesus' name, soon and very soon, we're gonna be able to gather together again. Soon and very soon. And I wanna have a party. So I hope you're sending me some information about what you think. I've been thinking about tacos. I've been thinking about all, I've been thinking about maybe we should have a little parade. You know, we got, we got a lot of street we can work with. We got our parking lot. Maybe a total parade. Just a great great celebration when this thing finally resides, but we know God is doing a great and mighty work in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So from the bottom of my heart, I just say to you, I love you. I salute you. Stay strong in faith. Your words have the power of life and death. Speak life even in this time. I can't wait to see you live Wednesday night at 7 p.m. But until then, let's all commit together to love people and point them to Christ. Hey guys, we just want to thank you for joining us online. We hope you enjoyed today's worship experience. Here at New Heights, we're passionate about two things, loving people and pointing them to Christ. So help us by liking, sharing, and commenting on everything you see come across our social media. It means the world to us. If you like what you experienced today, you can replay this message or any other message at www.newheightschurch.info. What about? <laughs> Three, two.